Tonight, China's condemnation after the U.S. shoots down a suspected spy balloon. A dramatic end to days-long international drama. It just looked like confetti and the rest of it just collapsed. Now the White House is forced to answer why it took so long. A car salesman blows the whistle on a dealership's illegal price add-on. So if a customer says, hey, I don't want to pay for this stuff, well, we're not selling a car to you. All in pricing, ignored, and caught by our Go Public secret shop. And Oscar frontrunner Brendan Fraser on his meteoric comeback and the role that changed everything. You must have loved doing this part. I did. Absolutely did. This is The National with Ian Hennemanse. And we begin this hour with breaking news, a powerful, deadly earthquake in southern Turkey. Those images collapse buildings apparently widespread, power outages reported in several cities, first responders struggling to help those hurt and search for those who are trapped. Susanna De Silva is watching this breaking news for us from our Vancouver newsroom. And Susie, at this hour, what do we know? Well, we know that it was a powerful earthquake that seems to have left devastation across wide swaths of Turkey and Syria. It's believed to be a 7.8 magnitude earthquake that also struck in the middle of the night. It was about 4.15 in the morning local time. People were at home asleep in their beds when the shaking began. It's believed it began uh, happened near the city of Gaziantep. It's a major city in the northern uh, part, uh, near the northern part of Syria. And witnesses say the earthquake lasted about a minute and it was felt hundreds of kilometers away, as far away as Cairo. And it, of course, has been followed by a series of powerful aftershocks, one just 10 minutes after the main earthquake. And as the sun has begun to come up, people are getting a better sense of the scale of the devastation. Entire streets have been leveled. Entire buildings have been reduced to simply piles of rubble. They're blocking roads. In one area, rescuers were calling for silence as they tried to listen for people inside an 11-story building that completely came down. Uh, other buildings are still standing, but not by much. And the death tolls now are slowly beginning to come in. Come in already in the hundreds. Hospitals are being overwhelmed as injured are being slowly rescued, but it is a challenging process. It will be a lengthy process because there are hundreds of buildings that have collapsed. In the province of Malatia alone, there are reports of more than 140 buildings, many of them again reduced to piles of rubble. And we are now seeing as well the desperate efforts by rescuers, by citizens, friends, family, everyone desperately digging, in some cases by hand, looking for any signs of life of friends or family who may be inside. A tragedy unfolding, of course, in Turkey and Susanna across the border in Syria as well. That's right. Officials there are calling some areas disastrous. A number of buildings there collapsed as well. And these are areas that have been ravaged by war for years. There are millions of Syrian refugees in that area who have been struggling because of the war, who are now dealing with the earthquake. We, they spoke to a doctor in one town who said he is fearful there could be hundreds of people killed just in that community alone and complicating all of these efforts. There has been a winter storm in the area. There is cold, rain, snow in many parts, and that will only complicate what will be a very difficult and challenging process as they get a handle on the full scale of what's happened. Susanna De Silva live in our Vancouver newsroom. Thank you. Thank you. So a tragedy of huge magnitude after an earthquake of huge magnitude. Let's check in now with seismologist John Cassidy. He is in Victoria. This was big and powerful. What can you tell us about the quake? Yes, um, thanks, Ian. This this was a huge earthquake at 7.8. Um, as you mentioned, the strong shaking for about a minute in that area. When you get to earthquakes of this magnitude, uh, you're looking at a very large fault that has ruptured or broken. So in this case, a minimum of a 100 kilometer long fault zone or, or even 200 kilometers. So it's a very long uh, region that's impacted by very, very strong shaking and and this uh this earthquake more than 15 million people experienced very strong to severe shaking uh, we have heard reports uh, eyewitness reports i guess of the shaking lasting a long time maybe up to a minute but you know the the anecdotes sometimes can be wrong what do you know about uh, we know it's powerful what do you know about the the length of the shaking from that original shock 
Yeah, that, that's actually probably quite accurate. It depends on the type of soil condition. If you're on rock or soft soil, uh, the shaking will last longer. But the bigger an earthquake is, the longer the fault that breaks and the longer the shaking takes place. So uh, for these little earthquakes that we feel around Victoria, Vancouver, or Ottawa, Montreal, every year, the magnitude threes, we feel shaking for a couple of seconds. For a magnitude eight earthquake, you're looking at a minute or more of strong shaking. And for the big magnitude nine earthquakes, uh, you're looking at five or even six minutes of strong shaking. So, um, you know, that one minute of, of shaking is is probably quite accurate. Yeah. And now, uh, you know, rescuers have to be aware of the potential for aftershocks. John Cassidy, seismologist uh, in Victoria, thank you very much for speaking with us. Thank you. Thank you, Ian. And you can keep up to date on the latest developments in this story on our website, cbcnews.ca. Questions and criticism tonight after the U.S. shot down that suspected Chinese spy balloon, a story that has been unfolding for days, prompting concerns not just south of the border, but here in Canada too. The balloon was taken out with a missile, something China says was too heavy-handed a response. But inside the United States, some say the operation betrayed weakness, not strength at all. So criticism at home and abroad and questions now about how this could affect Canada. Rafi Bujikanian takes us through it. After days of floating over the U.S., a direct hit from an American fighter jet on the suspected Chinese spy balloon. Look like confetti and the rest of it just collapsed. China has always claimed this was a weather balloon knocked off course by the wind. Its reaction to the shootdown was swift. The state broadcaster read a government statement calling it a clear overreaction and a serious violation of international practice. The drama had been playing out all week. I ordered the Pentagon to shoot it down on Wednesday as soon as possible. But the U.S. military waited days until the balloon was no longer over land. They have to consider the safety of the American people. Uh, the president called for this to be dealt with in a way that uh, balanced all of the different risks. For Republicans, that delay is a problem. The message embedded in this to the world is we can fly a balloon over airspace of the United States of America and they won't be able to do anything about it to stop us. The Defense Department says Chinese balloons have entered U.S. airspace before, including at least three times during Donald Trump's presidency, though Trump denies that. It's also believed that this recent balloon traveled through Canadian airspace, that encroachment a clear concern for Canada, say some observers. The Chinese are effectively signaling that if we make policy decisions that happen to displease uh, the Chinese regime, it could take aggressive action against us. So in essence, we don't have any capabilities to defend the sovereign airspace. The balloon debris fell over 11 kilometers of water off the coast of South Carolina. The Navy is now on a mission to recover it and examine it. And Rafi, what does the Canadian government have to say about all of this? Ian, the Prime Minister says he strongly supports the shootdown. The Defence Minister says Canada tracked and shared the movements of the balloon through the North American Aerospace Defence Command. We asked the Defence Department if other balloons that entered the U.S. also went through Canada first. No answers on that so far. Thanks, Rafi. You're welcome. We have confirmation tonight that a Canadian military aircraft has been deployed to patrol the sky above Haiti as that country tries to combat rampant gang violence. Kidnappings and murders are spiking there and gangs are accused of restricting access to water and health care for some people. The plane will help with intelligence gathering and reconnaissance capability. Ottawa says Haiti asked for the support. The Prime Minister will meet with Premiers on Tuesday as they try to reach an agreement on funding aimed at fixing a health care system clearly in crisis. Marina von Stackelberg sets up a high-stakes meeting with billions of dollars on the line. Peter Bell is one of just two family doctors in the small village of Charbot Lake, southwest of Ottawa. He's 80 years old, and he can't find another physician to replace him. Well, I'm getting close to the time to retire. Um, and I always thought it would be easy to find somebody else to come here because it's a pretty neat place to live and 
neat place to practice. Any traveling this winter, Wayne? Bell doesn't want to leave a thousand patients without a doctor. And a large percentage, percentage of them are elderly and a lot of them have complex health issues. One in five Canadians don't have a family physician. Just one of the many issues the provinces and territories say they need more federal dollars to fix. They want Ottawa to significantly increase funding from $28 billion a year to $45 billion. In 2023, it doesn't work anymore. It has to, we have to change the way we, we deliver health care in Canada. On Rosemary Barton Live, the federal health minister maintained Ottawa and the premiers must agree on priorities before more money starts flowing. We first must acknowledge that uh, A, we must repair the damage caused by COVID-19, but right. B, we must prepare for the challenges that we know uh, are with us and will be with us in the next uh, years and, and decades. Along with recruiting family doctors and healthcare workers, Ottawa wants provinces to reduce procedure backlogs, improve mental health services, and change how healthcare data is shared. We think we can get to a deal quite quickly with the federal government once the, the premiers are all on side about the broad outlines of the deal, which is what's going to happen at this sit down. A final deal is not expected this week, but BC's premier says he still hopes to leave this meeting with a better idea of what the federal government is willing to spend. Marina von Stackelberg, CBC News, Ottawa. A CBC News Go Public investigation has caught an Edmonton car dealership breaking the law, trying to charge a secret shopper more than it was allowed to for a vehicle. As Erica Johnson shows us, a former employee says it happened all the time. We're going to hit you with winterization, we're going to hit you with the admin fee, we're going to hit you with 3M. This car salesman is lifting the curtain on sales practices he says rip off customers. Almost like $10,000 difference to what we advertise online. Until recently, he worked at this Kia dealership, says the owner told his sales team to ignore the law. Alberta has what's called all-in pricing legislation. A number of other provinces have it too, or similar. When a dealership advertises a car, the price must include all fees and charges, except for taxes and any financing costs. So how many customers get that all-in price? Zero. Zero. Not, not one customer. So if a customer says, hey, I don't want to pay for this stuff, we sell them in their face um, um, bluntly, well, we're not selling the car to you. Go public, put it to the test. We sent a secret shopper in to supposedly buy this Kia car, advertised on the dealership's website for 29000 He's told he also has to pay for paint protection, tire and rim warranties, rubber mats, and other items. You're going to be faced with this everywhere that you go. So legitimate ads. Mandatory add-ons that boost the advertised price by more than eight grand. It's not okay to force somebody to pay an extra $8,000. What they're doing, it's illegal. This auto expert blames the regulators, says even in clear cases where dealerships have broken the rules, they don't crack down. In the laws that they have on the books, they don't force them, period. And the dealers know that. In the past fiscal year, just two Alberta dealerships have had to pay back $4,000 total to customers who were overcharged. A spokesperson for the regulator said educating dealerships about the law is key. The owner of Kia West Edmonton, Amadeo Palazzo, declined an interview request, saying in a statement his dealership follows the rules. Kia Canada said it's concerned about our secret shopper findings, has contacted the dealer, but says any more detail is confidential. Meantime, the dealership has removed all advertised pricing of new cars from its website. Erica Johnson, CBC News, Vancouver. Our Go Public stories come from you. If you have a tip for the team to investigate, send an email to gopublic at cbc.ca. There is some relief tonight in eastern Canada after that brutal cold snap this weekend. But as Sarah Levitt shows us now, many are still dealing with the aftermath. This is a far cry from just 24 hours ago when Halifax was in the grips of an extreme cold snap. It's certainly some of the coldest weather we have seen, not only this, this winter in eastern Canada, but in, in years. Cold that felt like minus 43 in Halifax, Minus 47 in St. John, New Brunswick. Wind chills not felt in decades. That glacial weather wreaked havoc on many from tens of thousands across the Maritimes losing power 
to frozen and now bursting pipes. I don't think I've ever experienced cold like this. And... On Cape Breton Island, Omo Omonodo lost power for more than 24 hours. And to make matters worse, his generator didn't work. The house was just too cold, way too cold. So I had to sleep with lots of blankets and <laughs> and uh, clothes just to keep just to keep warm. For some, though, hibernating at home wasn't an option. We wanted to make sure that there was that option for people, and the fact that there were people that stayed overnight showed that it was something that was needed. Back in Halifax, a nonprofit search and rescue team was out checking in on the unhoused. This was extreme cold. This was biting cold. This was uh, if you were outside for. Uh, for a second or two, you were certainly feeling it. We lost like 95% of the fish. Emmanuel Chiasson lost power and his generator also failed. Most of the Arctic char he breeds died as a result. We already advised the staff that we don't know how, how long we can keep them keep them working. Yeah, it's going to be a tough, tough ride. Even in Quebec, where this kind of cold is not uncommon, similar scenes of burst pipes and bitter cold. Some, though seemed unbothered. Sarah Levitt, CBC News, Montreal. And parts of Chile are under a state of emergency tonight as a blistering heat wave continues to fuel deadly wildfires. <laughs> Crews have battled dozens of blazes that have killed at least 24 people and destroyed hundreds of homes. The flames have already ripped through 270,000 hectares. That's four times the size of Toronto. Chile's neighbors have pledged to send planes and firefighters to help. The former president of Pakistan, Pervez Musharraf, has died. He was a close ally of Washington. Former U.S. President George W. Bush called him his best buddy. But as Jamie Strachan shows us, Musharraf's legacy is marked by tension and upheaval. Pervez Musharraf lived a life of conflict. In 1999, as Pakistan's army chief, he took over the country in a bloodless coup. You are aware of the developments of the past few days. Musharraf appointed himself president in 2001, a time in power shaped by the September 11th attacks in the U.S. The following day, Washington gave Pakistan an ultimatum. You're either with us or against us. Pakistan has taken a considered decision to be a part of the coalition, to be with the United States, to fight terrorism. The decision triggered widespread anger in parts of Pakistan, and it proved to be an uneasy partnership. Pakistan used to support the Taliban. It switched sides, supported the United States, helped the United States break the backbone of uh, Al-Qaeda. At the same time, he had contradictory policies. He continued to support the Taliban in secret, uh, which led to their revival. Musharraf's role in the war on terror made him widely known in the West, even appearing on U.S. late-night comedy shows. Where's Osama bin Laden? <laughs> I don't know. Nearly five years later, bin Laden was found in Pakistan. While he oversaw a period of economic growth, Musharraf faced domestic turmoil, two failed assassination attempts, and he repressed dissent, suspending the constitution twice and blacking out all independent media in 2007. He interfered in elections, uh, interfered in judicial decisions, uh, sacking Supreme Court judges. There were a lot of internal dynamics that created uh, problems within Pakistan's democratic uh, infrastructure. Musharraf's polarizing rule ended in 2008. He spent his final years in Dubai. He died at the age of 79 after a long illness, leaving behind a complicated legacy, both in his country and beyond. Jamie Strachan, CBC News, Toronto. We're learning more tonight about a dramatic rescue off the coast of Oregon. Video shows the moment a Canadian was pulled to safety after a wave slammed into a yacht. And as it turns out, that man was wanted by police in both countries. Here again is Susanna De Silva. The word May Day crackling over the radio was enough for the Coast Guard to turn an in-class training session into a real-world rescue mission. A rescue swimmer made his way to the yacht and the man on board desperate for help. And that's when this happened. The swimmer saw it coming. Um, and, you know, ducked under the wave, like kind of just in time. Uh, didn't quite get fully under the wave, got tossed around a bit as well, um, but was fine. The man was tossed overboard. 
The swimmer pulled him to safety. Incredibly, this was his first rescue. He actually you know, completed this rescue and graduated just a few hours later with his other classmates. So definitely a, a trial by fire and a christening for him and a job well done. The Coast Guard trains here near the mouth of the Columbia River, an area referred to as the Graveyard of the Pacific because it's so dangerous. After word of the dramatic rescue, the story took a twist. Then they released the video. We started putting two and two together. Hey, you guys. Police in Oregon realized the Canadian man was Jericho Labonte, wanted for mischief, for putting a dead fish on the porch of a home used in the 80s movie The Goonies just days before. Put stickers on the security cameras so that uh, they couldn't see him, but it was after he put the fish on there. So odd behavior. He's also accused of stealing the yacht he was rescued from and was also wanted in B.C. for harassment and mischief. I mean, I've worked you know, some serious cases through my career, homicide, shootings, that sort of stuff, but nothing, uh, this is just crazy. Twist and turns definitely is uh, the right word for it. After that dramatic rescue, Labonte was treated in hospital before being arrested. He's now being held by U.S. immigration. Susanna the Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Some secondhand retailers are saying goodbye to change rooms, but there's a catch. They don't give you your money back. Why some advocates say closing them is unfair. Next. Another show about another zombie apocalypse, this time brought on by fungus. But could it really happen? If they have that capacity, they could become major problems in the future. And he's the front runner for an Oscar. I need to know that I have done one thing right with my life. Brendan Fraser tells me how life in Canada helped change everything. It shaped me to who I am at my very core. We're back in two. After a three-year pandemic pause, Uber is bringing back a cost-saving option for customers. Riders can pay less if they're willing to travel with others and split the fare. It used to be called Uber Pool. It's now being rebranded as Uber X Share. So far, it's rolling out in Vancouver, Toronto, and Montreal. Now to a part of the shopping experience that hasn't returned, at least to some stores. Two of Canada's largest thrift store chains are keeping their change rooms closed. Secondhand shoppers say the policy's unfair. And as Sophia Harris explains, they're pushing back. It's trending on TikTok. Shoppers stuck trying on clothes in the aisles of Value Village. Help me! Instead of reopening its change rooms post-pandemic, Value Village has removed them from its 150 thrift stores across Canada. The Salvation Army has also nixed fitting rooms at its 98 thrift stores. At this Vancouver Value Village, some shoppers vented their frustrations. It can get sketchy in there. Like, I've seen guys, like, take their pants off <laughs> to try on jeans. It's like, I really miss the change rooms. You can't guarantee it's going to fit when you uh, buy it. Both the Salvation Army and Value Village offer exchange only. So if an item doesn't fit... They don't give you your money back, so you have to exchange it for something and maybe there's nothing in the store at that time. So I don't like that policy. It's not fair. This anti-poverty activist says the absence of change rooms could wind up costing shoppers already on a tight budget. They say, okay, if it doesn't fit whatever, return it, we'll give you store credit. But for some people, it's not convenient and they don't bother going back. The Salvation Army, a non-profit, told CBC News it axed its fitting rooms to make room for more merchandise and to address staffing shortages and increased theft. For-profit Value Village said it also made the move to offer more merchandise and to focus on safety and cleanliness. I really like this uh, sweater. But secondhand shoppers can still disrobe in private at goodwill. The non-profit thrift store chain reopened its change rooms this past July. It's a part of the service that, that we offer. So leaving our change rooms open and manned and clean um, is part of our service. The Salvation Army and Value Village say they've made concessions by allowing customers up to two weeks to exchange unwanted items and by adding more mirrors in stores. Sophia Harris, CBC News, Vancouver. Next month, Brendan Fraser will find out if his lauded performance will earn him his first Oscar.
Where'd you get all that weight? Someone close to me passed away, and it had an effect on me. The whale changed everything for the actor, but he's not resting on his laurels. Still an inherent instinct in me that someone's gonna walk in the room and like, go, hey, Fraser, get back in the dish pit. And... The Last of Us puts a killer fungus in the spotlight, and some scientists say they're working to prevent it in real life. It's a balancing act of finding a uh, drug that kills the fungus, but doesn't kill the patient. The National takes you deeper into the story shaping your world. Next. From a caveman brought back to life in Encino Man to George of the Jungle Watch out for the tree. to the mummy. There's something out there. Something underneath that sand. Brendan Fraser seemed to be everywhere in the 90s. Every good time and then suddenly he disappeared. Overcoming injuries he got making movies, raising his young kids, dealing with a very public divorce. And just as suddenly it seems, he's back. People are amazing. With his widely lauded portrayal of Charlie, the deeply troubled lead character in The Whale. I need to know that I have done one thing right with my life. The dramatic turn is his big Hollywood comeback, embraced by critics and giving this Canadian a serious shot at an Oscar. Very nice to sit down with you. My pleasure. The standing ovation in Venice, the, the speech at the Toronto International Film Festival, basically your name and the Oscar has been mentioned in the same sentence for months now. What's it been like living your life? That's, um, those are not associations I, I anticipated hearing in my professional um, journey. Um, but to hear that now is, um, it's, it's rewarding and it still feels like uh, um, that's about someone other than myself. <laughs> We're gonna talk a lot more about the film in a moment, but let's just step back for a little bit. And, uh, and I wanna talk about Canada. You, hmm. you, you have Canadian, Canadian parents, you, you lived in many places, including Canada. And I wonder what impact has Canada had on you or you as an actor? It shaped me to who I am at my very core. My ancestors are French Canadian. Um, I uh, grew up in Ottawa, in Toronto. Uh, my mother hails from Saskatoon and my father from Nova Scotia. It's a place that when, a country, whenever I travel back, it's, it, it's gotta be in my bones or my DNA or something because I suddenly feel I'm home. I was born in the United States, but I'm a Canadian born abroad. I should say also, while I, my high school days were in Toronto, mm -hmm. um, I, I was largely permitted to remain in, in, that, in school because of the association I had with the Little Theatre Company. It's really only where I fit in, to tell you the truth. I wasn't the best student, and I was not invited back for grade 13. Um, I had to make a quick decision to uh, decide, what does a 17-year-old kid do who's just fresh out of high school? whose real only place of feeling like I had some sort of um, association, some sort of feeling of community was working in theater. And I said, you know what, I'm, I'm gonna go train. Now I'm thinking about those movies in the 90s, Encino Man. Got the fresh nerd, squeezing the juice. Ow! Ow! Buddy. And George of the Jungle. Doki Doki! Ape kidnapped? Doki Doki! Ape napped! School ties as well. I think you're so pretty. The Mummy. We are in serious trouble. You were so successful, so visible. What were those, what was that decade like for you? Those roles were largely fish out of water characters, like a babe in the woods, right. the naif. 
um, the new guy in town. And I knew a lot about feeling like the new guy in town, given that we traveled every three, four years. Mm -hmm. so that came in handy, certainly, in a career pursuit in Hollywood. You're going to be reinventing yourself all the time, but you're still the same person underneath it all. I was looking at uh, a lot of video on YouTube last night, including an interview you did promoting The Mummy. We finally saw the movie, and we saw what was on the other side was this creature that Industrial Light and Magic created that's like fearsome. <laughs> But the thing that really struck me about all of that was the comments. And people, I mean, they loved you, but in these comments, they're just so fond of you. One person actually said, I hope Brendan knows, reads this, and, and sees how much we love him. Do you, do you have a sense of that? You just told me. <laughs> um, I, I, yes, is the answer. I, I appreciate the support, and um, I don't think anyone ever tire of anonymous stranger in the world who thinks favorably of you, right, right back at you, wherever you are, um, to you know, reinvent a, a classic in The Mummy that when, before it comes out, there are always, no matter what you do, there's always going to be people cast aspersions about it or naysay or say, oh, they blow it off. Um, and uh, it, it was kind of thought that it would be a, you know, a, a wonky movie about a guy wrapped up in bandages going, oh, <laughs> but it was the complete opposite of yeah. that. Audiences were delighted. And then you stepped out of the limelight for a period of time. Mm. And you've talked about it, but mm. since we're sitting here now, let, let me let me ask you, why? I had some injuries. I had some just standard issues that men get with joints, um, degeneration of soft tissues between bones and spinal, blah, blah, blah. But I did, and I was able to heal. I was able to address the issues medically, um, but it took me a while. It took me all in like about seven years, I think, spread out, um, which is my privilege because I'm much better for it. And it also gave me an appreciation of uh, what's really important to me, and that is my kids, my family life. Um, and that was when I first started my family. Um, and um, it wasn't until I did that I, when I realized, oh, this is why I run myself around doing this work, this job, because now I have a reason. It's, it's so that I can be there for them. And also, I can put that aside and not be the actor, movie guy. I just want to be a dad. And that's the time that I took to take advantage of it. Yeah. You gave a heartfelt speech at TIFF. It's the audience that gives cinema life. So um, I must thank you for keeping me in the job that I love. you talked about is is the risk in your words that the producers and the director of the whale took in in casting you what, what was the risk the the risk is that um, it might not find its audience um, by you know virtue of the and I am a, I'm a part of this the the fruit fly span of attention that we find ourselves with so much media and culture and the internet, etc., and um, sometimes we're reminded of of uh, actors who are talented, and that's something that that Darren has an eye for. I know he reinvigorated uh, Mickey Rourke's career with The Wrestler, a film I I, I love, a tough watch. Um, with Black Swan, I mean the same thing. Interesting that those both his films were both about. Uh, performers who were who were you know giving everything that they had 
or, or else dire circumstances. And in The Whale, uh, Charlie is a man with limited time, uh, a health challenge that leaves him with, on paper, five days. Um, and a great deal of, to good dramatic effect, um, regret that he has for life choices he has made or that have been made for him and the need to connect with his daughter in, on his path of redemption. You don't stay in touch with mom? She really only tells me things about you. Why? Because that's all I want to know about. That's a wonderful, traumatic conceit. And, and then at the same time, he, on paper, weighs 600 pounds. His body has been, his body's health has been compromised by uh, overconsumption and he finds himself immobile in um, this you know, miasma of g regret and guilt and, and aspiration, but at the same time, he's a guy who I feel like I know when I, I read this, or I wanted to be friends with this man. And they're you know, an amalgamation of people that I've known, certainly in my life, who influenced me to feel the way that Charlie does about the world, which is to bring out the honesty in others. He can see the good in them when they can't see that in themselves. And that, that's like a secret superpower that Sam Hunter, our writer, um, ascribed to him. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's uh, he, Charlie is suffering so much pain and there's despair, but there is a, like him probably some optimism. Is that, I don't know if that's the right word, but there's- Perennial optimism. Yeah. It, I think it's probably, part and parcel for having been so um, derided and recriminated all his life that the only alternative that he could have was to not collapse within to himself, is to take the opposite tack and do his best to bring out the good in others and implore them to, to um, speak honesty and, 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 and give, in his case, he's an educator, um, the writing that they um, are assigned to him, truth. The point of this course is to learn how to write clearly and persuasively. Think about that. Think about the truth of your argument. You must have loved doing this part. I did. Yeah. Absolutely did. It, it, it had all the elements of everything I love about filmmaking um, because it strikes the notes of the emotional journey that we all go on with... Um, in this instance, everything that we wish we could have said or would have said. If you, like a guy like Charlie, who I played in this movie, in any way struggle with obesity, or you just feel like you're in a dark sea, I want you to know that if you too can have the strength to just get to your feet and go to the light, good things will happen. You are at the top of your game. That's why people are associating you with the Oscars. A lot of people feel that you are the favorite to win the Oscar. I, it, that's a lot of tea leaf reading. I know, I know, know, and it's not coming from you, I know. <laughs> but I, I'm fascinated by people who are at the top of their game. And, and, I, and I wonder, like, well, let me ask you, what's, what's the secret to your success? I don't think I'm ever going to be um, able to answer that because I don't know that I've ever succeeded to tell you the truth, there's still an inherent instinct in me that someone's going to walk in the room and like, hey, Fraser, get back in the dish pit, you know? And I, I, I hope that never leaves me. I, I never want to get too, too comfortable. What's next for you? Um, it's an open slate. Um, <laughs> I'm going to, uh, I'm going to have to sincerely get back to you on that because I don't have a project lined up. I, I have, for sure, hopes and aspirations. I'd like to um, take advantage of all of that sauce at the moment to pursue projects that make me feel like I, I really care, like I really care about The Whale. I, I think it's a film that can do a great deal of good. And I'm not in the business of doing p -p public service messages or anything like that but I am in the business of make-believe, and um, it's my job to do my best to um, 
suspend disbelief and have um, something to offer in a way that's that's interesting and new and and can hopefully enlighten the discourse of um, our culture. It's a privilege to be a part of that. I hope I never lose sight of it. We know Hollywood loves a comeback story, and if he were to win the Oscar after basically disappearing from the spotlight for all those years, what a comeback that will be. Well, here's a whale of a problem. How do you take a giant, dangerous animal to the vet? Quebec zookeepers did it. They'll explain how in a moment, but first. You trust me? Can a fungal infection lead to a zombie apocalypse like in the hit show, The Last of Us? We take the question to actual scientists. Seen from the HBO hit The Last of Us, the post-apocalyptic series follows survivors after a fungal infection turns most of humanity into zombies. It is a terrifying concept, and it turns out there's some science to this fiction. Lauren Pelly looks at why experts say fungal infections could actually pose a threat to human health, though no sign of any zombies, for now at least. When you think of fungi, perhaps these come to mind. Slow-growing, almost otherworldly organisms. Or, if you're watching The Last of Us, it might be more like this. Terrifying fungal zombies. The show is rooted in actual science. Fungal infections can turn insects into walking zombies. Some can kill us, and others can mess with our head. Think of fungal-based drugs like magic mushrooms or LSD. The good news is our high internal body temperature can ward off most threats to our health, but that could change. They cause disease in trees, they cause disease in insects, but they don't cause disease in us because of the temperature. But now if they have that capacity, they could become major problems in the future. A new lab-based study out this week suggests cranking up the temperature sped up fungal mutations, which might mimic the impact of climate change in the real world. What's also concerning is that fungal infections are notoriously tough to treat. Unlike viruses and bacteria, fungi have a similar cellular composition to animals, plants, and us. It's a balancing act of finding a, uh, a drug that kills the fungus but doesn't kill the patient. Dr. Andre Speck warns the few drugs that do work might not work forever. There are plenty of species that are resistant to all antifungals that we have. What do you have growing on these plates? Inside this Toronto lab, researchers are trying to prevent a worst case scenario. We're looking for a bacteria that can kill fungi, um, and then we want to identify what those molecules with antifungal activity are. Fantastic. So fungal killers in the wild. Yeah, exactly. Fundamentally, they're the hope is developing new treatments. What we're trying to do is cripple the defense systems of the fungal pathogens and cripple their resistance mechanisms. But if fungal pathogens evolve and spread faster than scientists can keep up, reality could start to look a little more like science fiction, hopefully without the zombies. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. Thankfully, this next patient didn't turn into a zombie after getting sick. I think I can fit 10 times my hand inside this paw of his hind limbs. It looked like a huge teddy bear. The King of the North gets a checkup in our moment. You're looking at Kinook, the four-year-old polar bear that lives at the aquarium in Quebec City. He was behaving a little oddly recently, and so he had to be taken to the vet. How do you take a polar bear to the vet? Well, the answer is very carefully and with a forklift. Kinook's checkup is our moment. It looked like a huge teddy bear. 
At the beginning of December, Kinook looked uh, confused and, and unable to stand on his uh, pulse. We decided to go at the, the faculty of the veterinary medicine. We put him uh, in the truck uh, with a forklift and we have to drive for two and a half hours. So it's a big thing to um, have a 450 kilo polar bear coming at the hospital, of course. He is gigantic, he is beautiful. They are one of the most dangerous bears out there. So it's something special to be able to walk this close, to touch him. So we did some imaging tests. We did a CT scan of his head. He had also an abdominal ultrasound. You have to shave the, the fur. It's very funny because polar bears, they have black skins. So this black skin with this white fur. He had some uh, treatment and he responded very well. And so far he's doing great. Everything looks good. I have no more symptoms at this moment and everybody was really uh, happy about that. So in case you're concerned and no doubt you are, they are waiting for the test results to come back but uh, I think as they suggested in that piece uh, the treatment seemed to have worked and uh, the bear seems to be back to normal. That is The National for February the 5th. Thanks for watching. Have a good night.